The halls of the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame are lined with plaques of icons who went straight to the NBA out of high school. Kobe Bryant, Kevin Garnett, Tracy McGrady. Today, the NBA is dominated by transcendent stars who turned pro and got the bag before reaching the legal drinking age. Joel Embiid, John Morant, and of course, LeBron James. None of that would have been possible without Spencer Haywood. Just over a half century ago, the intrepid power forward, indignant over the NBA's oppressive eligibility rules, took the league all the way to the Supreme Court to fight for his right to play ball at the highest level and earn a living, regardless of his age or whether he first spent four years at college. And he won. But the victory didn't merely afford the 21-year-old the right to suit up for the Seattle Supersonics. Rather, Haywood's landmark courtroom win over the NBA in 1971 fundamentally reshaped the economics of the league and ultimately paved the way for a new era of player empowerment. The late 1960s were a turbulent and transformative time for the NBA. The expansion era was already underway, but with the formation of the American Basketball Association in 1967, the league faced increasing competition for eyeballs and for talent. While the NBA had more cachet and its owners had deeper pockets, the league no longer had a monopoly over the labor market. Plus, they also had a dubious eligibility rule in place that forced players to wait four years after finishing high school to be eligible to play. That rule served the league extremely well through its first quarter century. Not only did it strengthen their relationship with the NCAA by effectively forcing players to play four years of college basketball, it also reduced players' earning potential by keeping them out of the pros until their college class had graduated. However, the emergence of the ABA threw a wrench into the NBA's model. Technically, the ABA had the same four-year rule in place, but the fledgling league wasn't as militant about enforcing it. Their hardship clause allowed for underclassmen to sign pro contracts given extenuating financial or familial circumstances. Haywood, a prodigious power forward who grew up in abject poverty picking cotton in Silver City, Mississippi, was the first such exception. And at the age of 20, after dazzling for the US national team at the 1968 Summer Olympics and tearing it up as a sophomore at the University of Detroit, Haywood, eager to send money back home, went pro. Ahead of the 1969-1970 campaign, just two years removed from carrying Pershing High School to a state championship, Haywood joined the ABA's Denver Rockets, eventually finalizing a six-year deal worth $1.9 million and becoming one of the youngest pro basketball players ever. It all seemed too good to be true for Haywood, whose family members were making $2 a day for their grueling labor back in Mississippi, and that's because it was. Haywood dominated in his first season with Denver, averaging 30 points and nearly 20 rebounds a game en route to the ABA's MVP and Rookie of the Year awards, but his contract, it turned out, wasn't the slam dunk he thought he had signed. According to Haywood, the Rockets had misrepresented the terms of the deal, which in reality featured little upfront money and loads of deferments and annuities that Haywood wouldn't have received until decades later. A lengthy legal battle ensued over the validity of the contract, but Haywood, feeling betrayed, made up his mind before the case was resolved. He wasn't suiting up for Denver again. He was going to the NBA. It didn't matter to him that he was only 21, just three years removed from finishing high school, and therefore still ineligible to suit up per the league's four-year rule. NBA teams had been furtively sniffing around him for years, even while he was under contract with the Rockets, and he was gonna take one of them up on their offer. The eligibility rules be damned. He was tempted to sign with the Milwaukee Bucks, a burgeoning powerhouse led by a young phenom who would later change his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, plus recently acquired perennial all-star Oscar Robertson. But Haywood's most enticing offer came from Sam Shulman, the tenacious owner of the newly formed Seattle Supersonics. Shulman knew that Haywood's path to playing in the NBA would be fraught, taxing, and expensive, and he vowed to support the young star, financially, legally, and otherwise, every step of the way. And in December of 1970, even with the status of his Rockets contract still up in the air, Haywood finalized a six-year, $1.5 million deal with the Supersonics, upending the NBA. 
Just weeks prior, after all, Shulman had asked NBA Commissioner Walter Kennedy for permission to sign Haywood and received a resounding no. So when the Sonics owner went ahead and signed him anyway, all hell broke loose. Kennedy attempted to invalidate Haywood's contract and impose sanctions on the Supersonics. Meanwhile, from the moment Haywood first arrived in Seattle, before even making his debut, opposing teams tried to kibosh his deal through the courts. Famously, the Chicago Bulls sued the Sonics for $600,000 because Haywood was simply in uniform at Seattle Center Coliseum for a 128-109 Sonics victory. The Bulls called his presence a diminution of their playoff chances. Haywood didn't even play that night. Neither Haywood or Shulman were going to back down though. Instead, Haywood struck back, filing an antitrust suit against the NBA that argued that their four-year rule amounted to a group boycott that infringed on his right to earn a living. It was on. And as his lawsuit wound its way through the courts, amid a torrent of injunctions and stays, Haywood played some impressive basketball too, at least in fits and starts. Though he was limited to just 33 games due to the relentless litigation from the NBA and the rest of the league, Haywood was a force when he was on the floor. The rookie averaged 20.6 points and 12 rebounds per game for the Sonics, helping the fourth year expansion team to their best record yet. His numbers are even more impressive given the hostility he encountered at every turn. On the road, Haywood was routinely jeered by opposing fans, while public address announcers repeatedly referred to him as an illegal player. Once, in Cincinnati, Haywood was escorted out of the stadium and into the snowy night during pre-game warm-ups, wearing only his uniform. Meanwhile, his fellow players also treated him with disdain. Many of his peers refused to talk to him or shake his hand, seeing Haywood as a threat to their jobs and a troublemaker who had circumvented the system. Even future Hall of Famer Oscar Robertson, the venerated Players Union president who himself filed an antitrust suit against the NBA, allegedly turned his back on Haywood when the youngster tried to introduce himself. Still, in the face of all that hostility, the 21-year-old still delivered on the court, and his lawsuit was about to transform the NBA. By March of 1971, Haywood versus the NBA had made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a resounding 7-2 decision, the highest court in the land ruled in Haywood's favor. Haywood had a right to play in the NBA and had a right to pull on that Sonics jersey. The Supreme Court said so. In his decision, Justice William O. Douglas reiterated the ruling made by the lower level district court, who had previously determined that not allowing Haywood to play for Seattle would be a great injustice. He had won. The 21-year-old son of sharecroppers from Silver City, Mississippi had beaten the NBA and the league was changed forever. Following the ruling, the NBA amended their four-year rule by adding the hardship clause, just like the ABA had, which allowed players as young as 18 to go pro in the event of sufficient economic hardship. Before long, however, the rule became a mere formality. In 1972, eight college underclassmen were declared eligible for the NBA draft under the new hardship exemption, including second overall pick and future Hall of Famer Bob McAdoo. By 1975, 20 players were draft eligible under the hardship rule, including a pair of high schoolers, Daryl Dawkins and Bill Willoughby, both of whom went in the first round. They soon became the first two players to make their NBA debuts within months of finishing high school. Contrary to their fears, the additional high-level talent coming into the league year after year was in fact a boon for the NBA, facilitating further expansion, an eventual merger with the ABA, and major financial growth. But the amendment to the four-year rule was also a significant shift towards player empowerment. By removing that barrier to entry, players were able to enter the labor market when they saw fit and were no longer losing prime earning years to the NCAA. And so salaries escalated exponentially. According to historian David Friedman, the average player's salary rose from 35,000 in 1970 to 180,000 in 1980. In fact, it's because of Haywood's courage and conviction that the path was clear for some of the biggest names in modern basketball history to make the jump to the NBA and sign lucrative contracts as recent high school graduates or college underclassmen. Magic, MJ, AI, Kobe, LeBron, they all ran because Haywood walked. Over the years, the NBA's draft eligibility rules have been tweaked more than a few times, 
but the framework established by Haywood endures, not only in terms of the mechanics of the draft, but in the spirit of player empowerment. Today, the NBA is a league built on young superstars who know their worth, get paid handsomely, and aren't afraid to advocate for themselves. For that, they owe a debt of gratitude to Spencer Haywood. Thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more content like this, hit that subscribe button.